What's going on guys? This Sunday, March 20th, 4 p.m., we get into home economics and I wanna talk about why that's gonna be so important going forward. I've been doing a lot of research in American income and there's one direction that American income is going. It's going down. And we're gonna talk about why American income is going down what is the problem and yes for those of you who are so interested in solutions we will be talking about solutions but first of all let's get into the problem my video where your granddaddy's fifty six hundred dollars per year was greater than your thirty five thousand dollars today was very eye-opening i've been doing a lot of research digging into numbers looking at analytics and i've come to a conclusion that's going to seem kind of dubious it's going to seem kind of um, conspiratorial but just looking at the numbers is this this didn't happen by accident this wasn't a natural occurrence of the economic environment this this didn't just happen one of the big things that is happening that is very problematic is that in today's world, we, we can go back. You know, I'm kind of fortunate that I had some of yesterday's world where things didn't change that rapidly. I remember it took years and years and years for new technology to catch on. It took, it took me many years to go from having a land i used to have a landline landline i used to have a landline phone and when verizon came off with this pack with free evenings and weekends and i think i had 800 minutes i was like i'm about to get rid of my home phone that was at the time somewhat controversial so it literally i grew up in the era where it took years and years and years and years for things to change. But today's world, things change like that. And that's where we are today. So we cannot look at yesterday's mores or yesterday's uh, happenings as they impact today because literally we live in a world, uh, we live in a world where change is so fast change is so quick that if you blink you can literally miss it because i'm going to talk about one big change that happened that just kind of snuck up on us once again i did this video talking about the gig economy and the low income of gig workers this is something that is going to take over the world gig economy jobs are going to take over the world i looked at some of your comments and some of you like these jobs weren't meant to be permanent jobs. Let's stick a pin in that right now. Working in a fast food restaurant wasn't supposed to be the job for adults. Wasn't supposed to be a job for an adults. How many of you have seen an elderly person working in the McDonald's or Hardee's or Wendy's? So, what these jobs were intended to be, a lot of people didn't get the memo because these people needed money and they, there was a job and they worked the job and they got money. So what these jobs were intended to be and what they actually are, are two different things. And there are many people who are using gig work as a full time. Jen on the go talks about the dangers of having Instacart as your full time job because your income can be radically unpredictable. But here's the thing, and this is why I said this was done intentionally. Where do we learn the school systems? And the school systems are unilaterally uneven. Um, if you live in a well-to-do neighborhood, you're gonna have a better school system that's gonna teach you a lot of stuff that you need to learn. But if you grow up in the hood, your school system is gonna be operating in a resource deficient environment. So 
you go to school and this is where it gets very, very invasive. And this is where it gets very, very pervasive. You go to school and you look to your left, and you look to your right. Everyone in your class is in the same boat. You don't have a rich little friend to model and learn from. You don't because everyone in your class is in the same boat. And what we're seeing, once again, going to the top 9.9%, they're the buffer zone between the truly rich, because the 9.9% or the high income earners make six figures. They're doing well, but they're not rich, rich. They're doing well. Like the people in the upper echelon of the 9.9% are close to rich, rich, and some of them are rich, rich, but the average rank and file of the 9.9% is about a hundred to hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year. That's where most of them land. And that affords them a lot of perks and benefits. And what they are, the 9.9% are the bulldogs and the attack dogs of the 1%, or we could say the 0.5%. Elon Musk isn't in the top 1%. Elon Musk is in the top 0.2%. Literally, there's probably five or six people that are close to Elon Musk and you know Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett. And once you get past the, the 10 names, incomes drop dramatically, wealth numbers drop dramatically. So Elon Musk isn't in the 1.1%, he's in the 0.2% or maybe even the 0.1%. And essentially the 9.9%, these are the people like in my former neighborhood, Sandy Springs, that operate as the attack dogs, the bulldogs, if you will, the police force of the uber rich. They do all of the dirty work, at the community and local government level. They're the ones like in my neighborhood, it's kind of crazy, but you couldn't have more than four cars in your driveway. Now that doesn't seem like a big thing because the average person isn't gonna have four cars. Even the average family with a teenager driving may have just three. But one of the things that these things do is they prevent propagation in the 9.9%. The 9.9% toes the line, they follow orders, they, they carry their monitoring orders, they do what they're supposed to do, and what they do is present a model for everyone that's below the 9.9%. And once again, just looking at the numbers and doing the critical analysis, this didn't happen by accident. Um, this didn't just happen. How is it that the majority of Americans, 74%, make $35,000 a year or less? And also, why are we pushed to consume so much? One of the reasons that I was able to get rich is I don't really consume that much. I produce way more than I consume. Like this month, I was looking at my spend. Like last month, I spent a lot of money. I bought new camera equipment, I bought a new drone. I spent between uh, the finishing up of the house, I spent $70,000 last month. That's not normal spend for me. And this month, I have spent maybe 6,000 so far. And it ain't gonna get to 10. So one of the things is I've learned to control my consumption. I am not a big consumer. There's periods, and once again, this consumption that I participated in, it was for business. So the consumption that I consumed was to, so I can become a better producer. I didn't buy this stuff just to buy a drone, just to buy cameras. I didn't, I bought it for a reason. I had a purpose. I had intentionality with it. And one of the things is the average American's consumption has no intentionality. People out here just buying cars because I want a Hellcat. They're out here buying, like one of the things I've noticed, and I, I'm, I'm very observant, 
is Balenciaga. It's B-A-L-E-N-C-I-A. It's a clothing brand. And to me, these are some of the ugliest shoes they make, but I'm seeing, and they're quite expensive, and I'm seeing a lot of people wear those. I'm seeing a lot of people wear Yeezys. I'm seeing a lot of people wear Yeezy slides. They are very expensive. So people are out here consuming BS and they're programmed. And this is where I get to the conspiracy uh, theory. This is where I get to the disintentional. There are seven production companies that pretty much run everything. Fox is one of them, ABC, Walt Disney. Literally, there's a handful of media companies that are producing massive media. Netflix is one of them. And like, there's like 10, there's like 10. And I'm looking at the agenda. Let's go ahead and go back to the GMC commercial where the girl comes in and she gives the guy a watch, a red one and a black one. Then they go outside and he has a uh, red truck and a black SUV. I forget the colors. And you know, he's like, I bought these. And she runs to the truck and she clings to it. She's like, I love it because he bought the truck for himself. That's programming. You're getting programming to make you feel that being rich because it's a modern house that they're in front of. That's like a $2.5 million house. That's $90,000 worth of vehicles. They're making you seem that you can be wealthy if you just buy these things and consume. That's the inference. They're making super wealthy posture look average, normal, even though it's quite exceptional. And this is where the media companies come in and this is where the programming comes in. I look at, cause like, I don't really watch a lot of normal television. I typically watch Netflix and I watch movies and I watch sports, primarily football. That's the pretty much the majority of my television consumption. Okay. And I started looking at these shows and I started to look at the programming and I started to like, it's really insidious because whenever I watch something, I don't just passively sit down and watch it. I watch it with my mind activated and it's like, well, that's interesting. And this is interesting. And why did they put this in here? And why is this like, I may piss off some folks. There is a gay agenda right now. Now, gay people make a large, I think gay people, I don't know. I, I haven't Googled it, but I think gay people make up maybe 7% of the population. I'm not sure. But why is such a small part of the population getting so much movie time? And this started years ago. How many of you have watched a movie with a homosexual love scene? I've seen it because every time I see it, I was like, this is odd because I want you to compare and contrast. I want you just to mentally go through your mind and think about all of the homosexual love scenes you've seen. And I want you to compare that and contrast that to the number of black couples sex scenes you've seen. You don't see that many black sex scenes. You don't see that many black lovemaking scenes, even though the black population is significantly larger than the homosexual population. Go ahead, just start to think about it. like, um, Mer I forget this show where uh, it was about this attorney is something about murder. Uh, I forget the actress name. You would know her name if I could predict it, but it was about this attorney. She was a teacher and she had these law students working for her. And once again, she had the gay law student who you, you saw the gay law student have more love scenes than the black female cast. 
Like, correct me if I'm wrong. In your mind, I want you to think of all of the homosexual love scenes that you have seen in the last seven years and compare and contrast that to the number of black couples making love on the screen. It's odd that a demographic, that a demographic that is bigger gets less face time on the big screen. And I know many of you say it's racism and to a degree, I would agree. I would say, yes, it's racism, but the black consumer has a lot of money. And why aren't these media companies serving the black consumer? Why they're serving a smaller demographic than the larger demographic of black consumers. I'm going to tell you why. Gay people have advocates in Congress. This is something that I've learned from the Jews. If you go back to when Bill Clinton was in office, and if you could check this, you can fact check this. Jews, even though they only represented 3% of the population, was responsible for 50% of the political contributions back in the Bill Clinton era. So what I assume because I haven't checked into it, but if I know I check into it, I'm going to find this, that gay people have the same type of advocacy in Congress. Black folks do not. And every time you look at a small group that's getting all this FaceTime, that's getting all this press, if you follow the money, that's one of the things that was in 1960 movie. It's like, follow the money, follow the money. You follow the money, I guarantee you, you're going to see a, a money trail going back to well, like, um, I forget, he's a billionaire and he's gay. It's either Peter Spill, it's one of these, it's one of these, gay, I can see him, you know, he's got brown hair, he looks like a little boy scout, he is gay. Anderson Cooper is gay. Um, the black correspondent on CNN, I forget his name, Donald something, he is gay. And you're seeing that the gay advocacy is much bigger than the Hispanic advocacy. There are more Hispanic people than there are black folks. How many Hispanic love scenes have you seen in the movies? There are more Hispanics, there are more black folks than there are gay folks, but you don't see that kind of action. And this is why I'm saying that this is intentional. The programming is intentional and the income decline is intentional. The more I research it, the more I do the, the crunch the numbers, the more that I just see that this actually was done intentionally. Why? Let's go back to 1971. You didn't even have to have a high school diploma to do well in America in 1971. You could literally back, I remember this, when there used to be people who worked at the gas station that would pump your gas. There's a gas station in Sandy Springs where they actually still pump your gas. And you could literally start working at a service station pumping people's gas and literally work your way up to owning that service station. That's gone. That whole pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, that whole, it's gone. It is gone. And now we have the gig economy, which is permanent low wage. It's a permanent low wage system. If you get into the gig economy, because one of the things I've noticed, and I noticed that then when McDonald's started doing daily pay, and I'm gonna tell you why that is dangerous. When I was in the workforce, you had to do something that was called put two weeks in the hole, which means you would work for two weeks and not get a check. And then that third week you get a check. Now, the beauty of this is, is when you quit and you worked another job, there was no interruption in your pay because even though you were not there at that job anymore, two weeks in the future, you will get a paycheck. Now we have moved to this where people have to have 
daily pay. It started with McDonald's, Uber does it. I don't know if Lyft does it, I think they do it. And what this does is condition you to be on this hamster wheel. It's like, I go drive for Uber today, and I saw this a lot with the people who rented my cars. They would drive that day and they would make it, they would pay by the day. And this is a bad way to live. It is a bad way to live because you do not learn financial discipline getting paid by the day. You don't learn how to manage your money. You are on this hamster wheel where you're like, work, get paid, pay a bill, work, get paid, pay a bill, work, get paid, pay a bill. You're, you, you're not, because once again, all of these gig economy jobs are low wage. All of them. You're not going to make, I mean, on some of the better ones, you might do 35000 which to me is low wage. And essentially what you're positioning yourself is you're developing very bad financial habits. I feel one of the worst things is for you to get a job where you get paid daily because this pre positions you to expect and to develop the habit of getting paid daily versus getting a bigger check once a week or once every two weeks. This mentally alters your mindset, your perspective, and it alters your habits, which are demonstrably bad. So with the programming that we have, in the production of all of these low wage jobs, it makes me wonder who sat down and thought of this plan. Because the more that I research, the more that I look, this didn't just happen. This didn't just happen by accident. This was part of a plan. And also, this is something else too. From 1960 to about up to the day, our population nearly doubled. We had like 170 million people in 1960 and we're like at 340 million. Our population nearly doubled. Our population has stalled out. We're not, our population growth has dramatically declined. We're not producing humans and babies like we used to. It used to be the workforce would grow by like 10 million. The workforce is growing by three to four million people a year. So we're at a point where people are born and people are dying. And this, they're, they're just kind of like, those numbers just keep churning. Someone born, someone dies. Someone born, someone dies. They're kind of like neck and neck. And that is a problem because one of the reasons that America is who America is today is because of this robust population growth. So our population has stalled, our incomes have stalled, our opportunities have stalled, and the more I look at it, and I'm just sitting there like, it, it, it's just really, really bad. Because if you look at the next 10 years, in this gig economy, social media environment, there will be a select few who will go to the top. There will be a select few who will make a lot of money. But the average person is going to struggle. The average person is literally gonna catch hell in this new economic system that I don't understand who put it together. I don't understand because as I become more educated with the numbers, with the analysis, I begin to understand, and once again, I may get some hate for this, the Bitcoin cryptocurrency desperation plays. Yes, there have been some people who made a lot of money from cryptocurrency. I'm one of them. I made a lot of money from Bitcoin. And what you're seeing is people who are moving because like it's past hope it is past desperation because a lot of people are not stupid they're understanding that the game is rigged against them and they're because they, i'm actually 
thinking, how did I get out of that system? Because I'm not part of that system anymore. I actually got out. I got out of the go to work, um, get a check every two. I got out of that system a long, long time ago. And what I feel is I got the right information at the right time and I acted upon it because it all goes back to education. It all goes back to education. So if you're attending a poor or badly managed or badly run school, you're screwed because you're not getting the education that you needed. So I embarked on a rigorous routine of self-education. I read a lot of books. I exposed myself to new concepts and new ideals. And I feel at that time that I did that was pivotal for me. Now, I feel that is still doable. However, you have got to get the right information and you have to act on the right information, which could be a little sketchy on the YouTube, TikTok, Instagram streets. I have proven that a lot of people here on the YouTubes are straight up lying to you. So it makes it hard for you to find the right information. And then it's even harder when you find the right information to act upon it. So I feel once again, you can get out of the system but it's going to take an extraordinarily large effort to get out the system. And once you get out the system and once you get above the system and where you can look down and you can like, good Lord, that's terrible. That's terrible. Right now, I'm about to go somewhere and a lot of y'all get mad when I go off on these tangents, but right now there's some mommy that's going to be sucking the old man's dick tonight because she needs money. I know y'all don't like me to bring you or remind you, but the sex work is about to explode. Right now, it's almost 9 p.m., there is some young tender getting ready to go down on an old bird. Now, this is where it gets real, real real sketchy right now there's some young man walking a street who's going to be turning homosexual tricks he's going to get his cheeks split tonight by some man we're going to see a massive explosion in sex work because this is going to be the only thing that some people have a value that they can sell. And the price of trim is about to go, it's about to plummet because why is, the trice, why is the price of trim about to plummet? The market is about to be flooded. Once again, I don't know, uh, I heard that it wasn't something that you would actually, you, if you meet a prostitute or a hooker you don't negotiate the price. I feel that's going to change. I feel that men are going to like, well, what about this price? And because the prostitutes and sex workers are going to be desperate, they're going to take these lower prices. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Like once again, that's what I assume that's, you know, based upon all the stuff I've seen that these girls are getting these extraordinarily sums of money to perform a sexual act that's going to change because the market is going to be literally flooded with female sex workers and with male sex workers. This is the first time in history that we've had very, a large contingency of feminine men. And these are men who act very much like women. You already have that with the flamboyant homosexual male. And now, you're going to see an explosion in that activity. You're going to see an explosion in female sex works, male sex works. You, I don't even know um, how 
people are going to make money because there's going to be so many people doing it. Like, honestly, I don't know how porn makes money because most of it's free the way I understand it. And you have not even, if you didn't know, porn drives the internet. Porn is one of the most consumed things on the internet. And what we're going to see with the educational system, with the 9.9% .9 being the attack dogs of the rich and the uber rich, we're going to see a change in the world of dramatically lowered income. All right, income's already low, right? It's going to get lower. It's going to get lower unless you find a way out. And I'm speaking to you, man to man, man to woman, whatever, whoever's watching this, because if you do not find a way out, you are screwed in this new economy, during this global reset, you are screwed. And that's not the worst of it. No, 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 that's not the worst of it. Your children are screwed. And then your grandchildren are screwed. Typically, and there have been studies on this, that whatever social economic level that you're born into, typically is the one you will die in. So one of the, and they did a study of kids who were being successful and the kids who were the most successful came from wealthy families. You had outliers like me. I'm an outlier. I'm not atypical. I'm not normal. I'm a little different. I'm an outlier. I'm not normal. What happened to me is not normal, but part of that, and I'm about to talk about why I think it happened. I remember when I got laid off and at that moment, something in my soul shifted and I made a promise to myself that I was never ever going to get laid off again. And I think that was that, that one, that thought process is everything that drove everything that came after. I made a promise to myself and I've never been laid off since that time. You want to know why? Because I was like a Marine stick and move, stick and move, stick and move. I would go in the company. I would get all I could get out the company, then bounce and go to another company, get all I could get out the company, then bounce. I became very mercurial and became very much all about me. I became extremely selfish. I became extremely self-centered. And that shift that I made 25 years ago that I was never going to get laid off again is the reason that I feel that I am where I'm at today. And that was one thought process that matriculated into many more thought processes. It was just the beginning. And I feel that you need to find whatever you need to find to shift you so you can get out because I'm here to tell you it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. We're doing the global reset. We're about to have a recession, a recession. We're having massive inflation. We've not had this kind of inflation in the last 40 years. These are indeed strange times. So you got to find your way out. So what I'm getting ready to do this Sunday at 4 PM, and I want you to hear me and hear me well, you want to be part of home economics. Now what is home economics? It is how to manage your money. It is not that we're not in, we're not into the business building stuff yet. You want to know why this is foundational? Because if you go through the home economics course and you get the concepts, here's something that's very exciting, something that should make you do the happy dance. Once you go through home economics and you get those strategies and principles, when you get money, you will never be poor again. Let me say this again. You go through the home economics course, and you get these principles 
things that I've never talked about here on YouTube and you get these principles, you will never be poor again. And then when you start a business, you will actually see 10, 20, $30,000 in your personal checking account pretty much all the damn time. And then you'll even see more money in your business bank account because the thing is you have got to develop better money management habits. It's, in, it's imperative for you to escape the coming grooming. And once again, American income is going down. It's not going up. It ain't stabilizing. It's going down because of the education system, because of we're manufacturing all of these low wage jobs. I didn't know. I knew from an intellectual standpoint that, you know, a lot of people didn't make a lot of money, but until I dived into the numbers and saw, cause literally I went and crunched numbers and added all the numbers up. Like how many, how much money did agriculture workers make? There's 26, there's 20 million of them. How much do government and state employees make? There's 20 million of them. And once I started to put the number of employees in these fields and calculate it, and then there's 129 million full-time workers. And there's about 34 million part-time workers. Once you, those 34 million part-time workers, they don't make 35,000. A lot of them don't even make 10,000. It's really, really bad when you shift from full-time to part-time. It's well bad. So when I started crunching these numbers and I was like, good Lord, no wonder. I, so, so, so many things became clear. I had people here on my YouTube channel, even though I was showing receipts, ATM, checking accounts, card titles, who just could not believe that I paid cash for those cars. And now I understand why they couldn't believe it. These people cannot even fathom putting down $5,000 for a car, let alone paying cash for a car. They can't see it. They can't see it. They can't conceive it. I didn't understand that because I'm in my bubble. In my bubble, the world is nice. The world is different. But I stepped out of my bubble and I began to look at the world the way it really is. And it's really ugly. It's really ugly. So now I understand why people couldn't believe it. Like, I still get questions like, really, you paid that? Once again, to someone who's caught up in the matrix, who doesn't make a lot of money, to, and this is one of the reasons that I'm, I've stopped showing receipts. You will not see me flex or stunt ever again on YouTube. You will not, you know, in case, you know, for something for like, you know, you might see a little bit of that on a corporate game to illustrate a business concept, but here you will not see it. You will not see it because when I looked at the number of people who were suffering, who were struggling, who weren't making money. And then I'm here on YouTube talking about, I got all this, I got all that, I got all. It was too much. It was just too much. It is too much. Since I have stopped with the stun and stuff, my views have literally exploded because now I am more relatable to the average person. At one point, I was kind of like Zeus on Mount Olympus. I was kind of like a demigod. You, you couldn't relate to me. Wait a minute, you, you, you doing this, you doing that, you doing, I can't relate to you, man. That ain't my life. That ain't even close to my life. So now since I've made the switch to discussing the economy, discussing accurate numbers, more people can relate to me because we're talking concepts. We're talking business. So this is more palatable and easier to digest than the stuff that I was putting out. Now, I'll be putting that stuff out on the corporate game, but that's a whole different channel for a different audience. And also, once again, just as I do my research and I come across these numbers, the more I think this was intentional. This just didn't happen. This wasn't, you know, unless, you know, we believe we came from this primordial soup 
that one day the soup just shifted and then human life was created, if you believe in that. Uh, and that's a whole different conversation. I'm not even gonna touch on that because that's a deep rabbit hole. But one of the things that I am consistently seeing, one of the things that I am coming to understand that the game is rigged against the average person. Let's go ahead and examine that. How did I get out of being an average person? I told a lie. What I did was I understood the game, that there was jobs that I wanted, but I couldn't get because I didn't have a reference. Notice I didn't say experience. The key was the reference. And I figured that out and I created my own reference and I got that first job where I made more money. rent a -Crate started me off at $35,800. Adjusted for inflation, they started me off at damn near $60,000. That's why I'd be getting paid today if I had a job at rent a -Crate today. Adjusted for inflation. I would be making almost $60,000. So it was a really, really good job. Really, really good job because things were cheaper. I was able to pay all my bills, I had plenty left over. But once again, once again, I was on the mission. What was my mission? Say it with me. I will never be laid off again. That was my mission. That was my mandate. So I didn't go into rent a crate like, oh man, I'm making $38,500. I'm going to stay here forever. And no, 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 no. I'm going to stay here and get whatever I can. And then I'm going to leap. I was at rent a crate eight months. Then I went to panel systems where I was there six months. And then I went to business environments where I was there uh, about a year and a half. And I only stayed that long because I was making money. See, I became an agent, you know, like once again, the more and more I look at this, the more that I see it's intentional. This was no accident. This was no accident. This was very much intentional. And you're going to have to be very intentional if you want to get out. You can get out. You can get out. But it's going to take a huge effort for you to get out, for you to actually do what you need to do to grow and become that person who can escape the matrix. Because American income for the average person is going down. So if you want to learn some escape strategies, because once again, it's going to be very important that you manage your money well. And this is not about trying to get wealthy. This is about trying to survive. You're going to have to manage your money very well just to survive. And then once again, what we're going to be talking about with home economics and all these other things is things that you can do to begin to manage your money very well. And then the next module will be about building a business. I feel that it's very foundational. I feel it's very important for you to learn how to manage your money, especially in the global reset, inflationary environment and recession coming soon. All right, this is Glendon Cameron. That's all I got for you. Let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comment section with these well-constructed comments, and I will see you in the next one.